Joseph. Somewhere on the Atlantic Ocean, 1939, 11 days from home, Joseph's mother grabbed for his father's flailing arms, but Aaron Lander was too strong for her, thin as he was. No, no, they're coming for us, he said. His eyes frantic. The ship is slowing down. Can't you feel it? We're slowing so they can turn us around. Take us back to Germany. Joseph's father pulled his arm away and knocked over a lamp. It fell to the floor with a crash and the light went out. Joseph, help me, his mother begged. Joseph pulled himself away from the wall and tried to grab one of his father's arms while his mother went for the other. In the corner of her bed, Ruthie buried her face in Bitsy's ears and cried. No, Joseph's father cried. We have to hide. Do you hear me? We can't stay here. We have to get off this ship. Joseph grabbed his father's arm and held on tight. No, Papa, we are not turning around, Joseph said. We are slowing for a funeral, a funeral at sea. Joseph's father stopped dead, but Joseph kept a tight hold on him. He hadn't wanted to tell his father about the funeral, but now it seemed the only way to calm him down. Aaron Lando's bulging, haunted eyes swept to his son. A funeral? Who's died? A passenger? It was the Nazis who did it. I knew they were on board. They are after us all. He began to drash again, more panicked than before. No, Papa, no, Joseph said. He fought to hold on to his father. It was an old man, Professor Whalier. He was sick when he came aboard. It's not the Nazis, Papa. Joseph knew all about it. Ruthie had begged him to go swimming in the pool with her and Renata and Evelyn that afternoon. But Joseph was a man now, not a boy. He was too old for kids' stuff. He'd been walking the outside boardwalk on B deck instead, keeping an eye out for the man from the engine room, Suki and Dick, and his friends. When he heard a cry from one of the cabin portals peeking inside, he saw a woman with long curly black hair and a white dress sobbing as she lay across the body of an old man. Captain Scroeder and the ship's doctor were there too. The man in the bed was perfectly still. His mouth open and his eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. He was dead. Joseph had never seen a dead body so close up before. You dare, boy. Joseph had jumped. A woman walking her little dog on the boardwalk on B-deck had caught him peeping. He had sprinted away as the little dog barked at him. But not before Joseph heard the ship's doctor say that Professor Whalier had died of cancer. In his family's cabin now a few hours later, Joseph still clung to his father's arm, trying to calm him down. He was an old man, and he'd been sick for a long time already, Joseph told his father. They are burying him at sea because we are too far away from Cuba. 
Joseph and his mother hung on to his father until Joseph's words finally got through. Papa stopped struggling against them and sagged. And suddenly, they were holding him up off the floor. He was sick already? Papa asked. Yes, it was the cancer, Joseph said. Joseph's father let them guide him to his bed, where he sat down. Mama went to Ruthie to comfort her. When is the funeral? Papa asked. Late tonight, Joseph told him. I want to go, his father said. Joseph couldn't believe it. Papa hadn't left the cabin in 11 days, and now he wanted to go to the funeral of someone he never met. In his condition, Joseph looked worriedly to his mother, who held Ruthie in her lap. I don't think that's such a good idea, Mama said, echoing Joseph's thoughts. I saw too many men die without funerals at Dacho, Papa said. I will go to this one. It was the first time his father had even spoken the name of the place he'd been. And it was like a winter frost covered everything in the room. It ended the conversation as quickly as it had begun. Take Joseph with you, then. Mama said, Luffy and I will stay here. That night, Joseph led his father to a deck aft, where the captain and his first officer waited with a few other passengers. The passengers' clothes looked shabby, and it was only when he heard his father tearing his shirt that Joseph understood ripping your garments was a Jewish tradition at funerals, and they had torn theirs in sympathy with Mrs. Whalier. Joseph pulled on his own collar until the seam ripped. His father nodded, then led him to the sandbox by the pool and had him take a handful of sand. Joseph didn't understand. But he did as he was told. The elevator to a deck arrived, and Mrs. Whalier em emerged first, a candle in hand. Behind her came the rabbi and four sailors who carried Professor Whalier's body on a stretcher. He was bound up tight in a white sailcloth like an Egyptian pharaoh. Hold on there, the man from below decks, Ski and Dick, pushed through the small crowd with two fellow crew members. I'm Otto Ski and Dick, the Nazi party lead on this ship, he said. And German law says that a body buried at sea must be covered with the national flag. Ski and Dick unfold the red and white Nazi flag with the black swastika in the middle, and the passengers gasped. Papa pushed his way forward. Never. Do you hear me? Never. It's a sacrilege. He was shaking worse than ever. Joseph had never seen his father this angry, and he was frightened for him. Skiendik wasn't the kind of man you wanted to mess with. Joseph grabbed his father's arm and tried to pull him away. Papa spat at the feet of Skiendik. That is what I think of you and your flag. Ski and Dick and his men surged forward to avenge the insult, but Captain Scroda quickly intervened. Stop this! Stop this at once, steward! 
Captain Squirrel the commented. Skiendic addressed his captain but never took his eyes off Joseph's father. It's German law, and I see no reason for an exception to be made in this case. And I do, Captain Scroder said. Now take that flag and leave here, Mr. Skiendic, or I will relieve you of duty and have you confined to quarters. The steward held Papa's gaze a long moment more. His eyes shifted to Joseph, giving him goosebumps, and then Skiendic turned and stormed away. Joseph's chest heaved like he'd been running a marathon. He was so wound up he was quivering worse than his father. Sand slipped from his shaking fist. The captain apologized profusely for the disturbance, and the funeral continued. The rabbi said a short prayer in Hebrew, and the sailor slid the body of Professor Wheeler over the side of the ship. After a moment, there was a quiet splash. And the mourners said together, Remember, God, that we are of dust. One by one, they stepped to the rail, where they released handfuls of sand, the sand Joseph's father had told him to take from the sandbox. Joseph joined his father at the rail, and they scattered their sand in the sea. Captain Scroder and his first officer put their caps back on and saluted. They touched the brims of their hats, Joseph noticed. Instead of giving the Hitler salute, without words, the funeral service broke up. Joseph expected his father to return to their cabin right away. But instead, he lingered at the rail, staring down into the dark waters of the Atlantic. What is he thinking? Joseph wondered. What happened to him at that show that he is now a ghost of the man he once was? At least he didn't have to be buried in the hell of the third rage, his father said. The ship rumbled softly, and Joseph knew the captain had restarted the engines. They were on their way to Cuba again. But how much time had they lost? The end for 19.